Orders does not require stakeholder input or offer guidance on what information to provide about administrative fees. Uh, and so accordingly, we made recommendations to the core outlined in our report to improve its agency-wide policies in these areas and develop better tracking mechanisms of the costs associated with these activities. Uh, as Paula mentioned, the core agreed with our recommendations and has indicated that we'll be developing a new policy to address most of these issues over the next year and we'll be following along closely to ensure that they do so. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. Be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Very good. I would appreciate, again, our witnesses being here. And we'll start with, with questions. And I want to say this. I said this to a, a group this morning. This is, in, in the seven years I've been in Congress, seven and a half years now, uh, this is only, and I've been on the Oversight Committee the entire time, this is only the second field hearing that I've had. So we don't do many of these. The first field hearing was in uh, Lyon County, the, the team that just won the state tournament, in basketball, we had a field hearing to discuss the Asian carp invasion uh, in the lakes in West Kentucky. And out of that hearing, we ended up getting a substantial amount of funding. And I think we've made progress on uh, eliminating the, the uh, a big percentage of the Asian carp. I don't think they'll ever be fully eliminated, but uh, that was a very successful field hearing. And I hope that this will be a, a very successful field hearing uh, after, uh, after a few, few weeks of digestion of, of this hearing and we can take what we learn and, and move forward. So uh, we don't do these very often. I want to thank the Oversight Committee for putting everything together. Again, thank everyone for being here. Uh, we'll start with the, with the questions. And I want to give some examples of, of why we're here today. Uh, the small business owners in this region have shared the exorbitant and seemingly trivial fee demand they've received from the core. Small business owners have received $500 administrative fees for tasks such as obtaining an approval letter, approving a lease, and approving an event. Others have received $2,000 fees for review of a $5,000 total cost action and $9,500 for review of a marina expansion. One received a whopping $20,000 fee for a review of a marina development. So, Ms. Johnson, you, as the chief of real estate, what do you think of, of those fees that I, I just mentioned there? Is that normal or, or is that uh, something that, that should be acceptable? Or, or what do you think? Oh, well, sir, it is typical that we have a range of fees uh, in the lower category for more simple um, licenses, more simple transactions. Um, renewals kind of in a medium range fee and when we're doing new out grants or full development uh, reviews, then the fees are generally larger and that is because there are more requirements associated with getting to those approvals and those instruments. So we're required to comply with NEPA and some other environmental laws, CERCLA, so, it de so the fees vary depending on the degree of review required. Okay. Uh, General Quander, I'll ask you the same question. As a division commanding general, what, what do you think about those fees I just mentioned? Chairman, we do our best to follow the policies that uh, we have that govern um, the, these administrative fees, whether it's a standard fee or whether it's a more complex one. And at the end of the day, we're not trying to do something that's exorbitant. We're trying to do something that that's reasonable and covers the cost of the folks doing the work um, um, that, that we've been asked to kind of oversee. Um, but we, we acknowledge the results from the GAO report uh, on some of the inconsistencies. Um, and I think to Ms. Paula Muick's, um, Johnson Muick's comment earlier, wage rates differ from place to place. And so... Uh, there is going to be some differences, uh, but we acknowledge that we have work to do to relook it and then also uh, be more consistent. And, Chairman, that's part of uh, what uh, Ms. Johnson Munich talked about with the corrective action plan from the GAO. Uh, we've read the report and, uh, and we have actions that we're going to do to uh, address the findings from the GAO report, sir. Mr. Vaughn, is that, are these fees that I mentioned? consistent with what GAO found in the discrepancies and inconsistencies of the fee schedule? 
Yeah, we certainly found a, a wide range of fees uh, that the Corps was charging. And while we didn't uh, look at specifically whether any fee was appropriate or not, we looked at the sort of methodology about um, uh, uh, setting the fee. Um, and so as has been mentioned, like we, we are much more interested in the Corps having a consistent methodology for how they approach those fees and that that methodology uh, closely reflect the cost to the Corps uh, of executing that work. We're going to dive more into these fees as we as we move forward today. Uh, I would like to note that I have a letter of support here from the Kentucky and Tennessee Marina Associations to the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure detailing the issues uh, that we're here discussing today. I'd like to enter that rec uh, letter of support into the record. Uh, so ordered. These are different than a committee here, and I would have some somebody object to that probably in the re real oversight committee hearing. Uh, the Corps is one of many federal agencies that manages recreation sites on, on federal water resources. Agencies like the Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, U.S. Forest Service, and the Tennessee Valley Authority also manage recreational lakes and do business with marinas. The Bureau of Land Management has an established fee schedule and updates it annually in alignment with OMB policy guideline. The National Park Service establishes guidance fees for businesses operating on their property based on the market price of the service provided, reviews their fees every two years, and mandates that fee schedules be placed on the applicable parks website. That's the National Park Service. General Quander, should the Corps do something like these other agencies, specifically the National Park Service, in, in uh, how they determine their fee schedule? Chairman, we, uh, in terms of how we advertise our fee schedule, and I'll, I'll first acknowledge the way we do it right now is it is mostly between the Corps and the, the person we're working with via email. Um, and I'll talk regionally from the Great Lakes and Ohio River Division. I won't comment on any of the other USACE divisions. Um, but we're uneven across the board, and, and we acknowledge, again, the GAO report on that. Uh, some districts do it better than others. Uh, and so for me, I've got to do a better job at a regional level of standardizing that. Uh, some districts have stakeholder engagements where they talk about their fee structures. Some post them a little bit more publicly. Some email them out, um, and, and some don't. And so as the commander of the Great Lakes Ohio River Division, uh, we're going to take a look at how we do a better job of that. I, I acknowledge the GAO report when it talked about uh, more publication uh, and um, how we advertise. Ch Chairman, I don't, um, I don't see why we can't do that. I think we've acknowledged that we're going to take a look at that as one of the corrective action plan findings. Okay. Uh, Ms. Johnson, you I'll ask you the same question. Should the Corps do something like those other agencies that have a similar role in, in uh, working with, with private stakeholders in assessing fees? Uh, Chairman, I would say that we're going, uh, two of the three things you said were publication, um, so more transparency on fees, and re-looking at those on a regular basis. Yes, we should be mirroring uh, and that's part of our improvement plan is to do that. In terms of how they set their fees, um, I think we, we've talked to BLM in particular before about how they do it, uh, and we've, we've done some comparison there. Uh, I don't know if, if ours needs to be exactly the same, but certainly we need to be looking at their models to see if we can incorporate what they have done. Um, no sense reinventing the wheel if we already have a good model. But we do have different authorities and different missions, so mm -hmm. I don't know if it will be applicable across the board 100 percent. Okay. Uh, Mr. Vaughn, uh, examining other agencies to compare to the core was outside the scope of, of your report. However, did you find that the core abides by any federal regulations when it comes to assessing administrative fees? Uh, do they abide by GEO's guidance on the matter? 
so in terms of abiding by federal regulation, yes, they have their own uh, regulatory authority to charge fees. Um, we was didn't it find consistent with anything, any other government agency, or was it inconsistent? So it's a little different. Um, okay. I think you mentioned that some of the agencies are using the authority under OMB uh, A25 that uh, allows government agencies to charge user fees. Those fees go back into the general fund. Uh, the Army Corps has its uh, own authority that it sought in the late 90s that allows it to charge fees but then use those fees to cover its own costs rather than go into appropriations. That was a result of earlier in, that, uh, in the 90s when the Corps' appropriations were cut and so they didn't have the funding to, uh, to provide real estate services or enough funding to provide real estate services and so because that funding was not coming back to the Corps. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's why they sought that authority. We didn't find that they were out of alignment with any of those regulations. Of course, as I outlined earlier, with respect to our design guide, um, they certainly look at uh, and charge fees according to the beneficiaries, right? So the beneficiaries of the service are getting the fee. So that's part of the design guide. Uh, they do have processes in place to consider public benefits versus private benefits. So there's a beneficiary pay concept in the, in the design guide. Um, so if you're the direct beneficiary of the service, then, you know, you should be paying some, some portion of that or, or all of it. Um, and so they do have a process for examining that mm -hmm. and for providing waivers in, those, in some instances where they determine that there's more of a public benefit than a private benefit. And, and you may have answered this, but because the Corps in the Department of Defense, mm -hmm. does that change the way they have to administer fees? Is that a problem or... Well, the Department of Defense also has its own regulation for mm -hmm. fees, but it's so they have, that's okay. that's that's kind of a, on the same um, under the OMB 825 sort of implementing regulations that DoD has for that. Um, and the one requirement that DoD has that you know we, we found um, that the Corps wasn't abiding by necessarily was that um, the DoD requires their installation or their other services to put information about fees on their websites. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the requirements we used to look at what the Corps was doing and determine that there was some website, you know, several of the districts and divisions didn't have information on the websites. Okay. And, and just so everyone in the, in the audience knows, we, with the oversight staffs up here on each side, and, and they're, these are our policy people, and we're taking notes, and we're going to try to uh, take what we learned from this and, and work to see that, that we can get some, get some improvement here in, in our uh, attain our uh, objectives. But before we dive into the issues raised by the stakeholders further, I, I want to discuss the report the GAO conducted at, at my request. That was one of the things we uh, requested on the Oversight Committee. Before we have a hearing, we usually try to get some type of uh, research report by an appropriate government agency. And the GAO uh, report was titled Army Corps of Engineers Better Alignment with Key Practices Would Improve Management of Real Estate Fees. So, uh, Mr. Von Ott, th this request came after the request that I made on this report, and we appreciate the report, uh, came after several stakeholders in, in the district raised concerns about arbitrary fees they had received with no clarity on how the Corps set those fees. So did your study find that this was a consistent issue across the United States? Uh, yes. Um, well, I mean, it varied from district to district and division to division, right? So, um, but yes, in general, we found that there was the communication to, um, to the users or the, vo the folks that were paying the fees was often just, a, here's what the fee is, the amount, um, versus what's going into the fee, what the, you know, all of the, the calculations or other information that might be useful to the user to understand sort of what, what, what they're paying for. Um, so we did find that that was a cons uh, a, an issue across most districts and divisions, yes. In, in your report, GEO recommends that the Corps develop an agency-wide policy to provide details to divisions and districts on how to estimate costs to set real estate fees consistently. Based on your study of the core, can you speculate on why this wasn't already taking place? Um, part of it was, you know, as General Quander talked about a little bit, there are some differences from division to division, district to div district in terms of the circumstances that they face, whether it be, you know, the environmental circumstances that they, they have in their districts or divisions, 
uh, or the labor rates or the, the makeup of the workforce that may be at different levels. Um, and so, so we understand that there would be differences uh, across uh, the districts in terms of how they, of what the fees actually would be. Um, as far as the methodology and the reason for the inconsistency there, uh, we attributed that mostly because the, the, the headquarters uh, folks sort of gave the districts and divisions leeway to set the fees how they seemed, how they deemed it according to, you know, uh, deemed appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was sort of the reasoning that we used. Um, so what we're looking for is really a, a more consistent methodology that districts use and divisions use to determine what those, what those rates should be. Okay. Well, can you elaborate on the methodology used to conduct the review of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer activities related to administrative fees? Their methodology? Their methodology, yeah. right. So, so most uh, districts, are the, uh, bas basically it's the hours it takes to conduct an activity times the cost of conducting that activity, mm -hmm. um, which is not an unreasonable way of looking at it, right? Um, but uh, the way that you calculate those two inputs uh, uh, varied, right? So you might have um, a, a district that's, you know, we see that we have, this is kind of our, uh, the, the range of folks that might be doing this work and their pay rates are, are this and that and we have a certain overhead cost that we apply. And so this is the rate that we'll use to multiply by the certain number of hours. Those hours are an estimate usually, oh, it may take five hours, it might take 10 hours to do this work. Um, and then some uh, other districts would look towards uh, headquarters, which has a, a resource that provides some general guidelines of like uh, that there's uh, anything might take 10 hours or anything, you know, or here's a basic rate you can use. Mm -hmm. um, and so the key thing that we noted is that none of those either, you know, in either instance are those tied to the actual costs that the core experiences for. This is particularly for the standard fees. Uh, because they're not tracking what those actual costs for the standard fees might be. In the case of uh, the, the special fees, um, those have their own budget line item, right? So those are tracked a little bit more closely, okay. the more complex ones. Uh, but for the standard fees, uh, there's not really a look, you know, a look going back to look and see whether those costs, mm -hmm. the, what was charged actually aligned with the actual costs. So how did you work to ensure the reliability of the data used in your analysis, particularly regarding the selection of divisions, districts, and individual fees for examination? Um, so we looked at, in terms of the way that we looked at this, is we uh, selected districts and divisions that had the highest dollar amount of fees and the highest number of fee these types of fees, mm -hmm. uh, and included the top three in our study of, in terms of divisions, and then the top two districts in each of those divisions uh, were included in our study. Um, it's not entirely representative um, of, the, of the whole universe, but we felt it was um, really captured the bulk of uh, and the, all the different types of experiences you might have in terms of the fee, uh, administrative fees. Um, then we looked at you know, just sort of how the core went about it. Uh, we didn't dive into whether the inputs that they were using, the reliability of those specific inputs, for example, um, you know, whether the average uh, hourly rate they were using was a reliable figure or not. We didn't determine that exactly. All we sort of looked fo focused on is the fact that that was not consistent across districts, as well as the fact that that was usually not tied to the actual uh, cost to, uh, that they, that they um, incurred in, in, uh, in the work that they were doing. So were there any notable trends or inconsistencies identified in how these fees were set and shared with fee payers and the public? Yeah, so um, generally, like as, as I mentioned before, you know, fee payers, they get um, usually a letter that describes that we are, we're going to be charging you this, this particular fee. Um, it didn't really have any further information about that. And then, of course, if you were to seek out on the website or elsewhere uh, to try to find more information on the fees, that was generally uh, inconsistent. You might find some information that they charge fees, but not a lot of detail about what those fees are or how they're calculated. Um, in the case of custom fees, it's a different story. Custom fees, the core will provide a more detailed estimate of what that custom fee looks like in it before the work is done um, because they're typically much more uh, costly. Uh, okay. But in terms of the standard fees, that's, that's generally what we found. Out of curiosity, were there any obstacles in, in trying to obtain your necessary research for the report? No, we didn't really experience. I face any. a lot of obstacles <laughs> in one particular investigation. I'm a 
part of, but it doesn't have anything to do with the Corps of Engineers. So uh, no, the Corps was uh, was uh, very uh, willing to well, that's good. share that information with us along the way. Yeah. Uh, what are some examples of instances where the Corps practices align well with federal guidelines and, and where improvements were needed? Yeah, so as I, uh, I mentioned, where they where we did find that they sort of generally aligned with our with our design guide was in the sort of considering the beneficiary pays principle uh, and in having policies in place and processes in place to consider waivers and things of that nature. So determining what is a public benefit versus a private benefit uh, and then setting those fees accordingly and charging the appropriate parties for those fees. Um, the other areas where you know we looked at in terms of uh, the design of the fee that's where we got into the consistency and found some issues with consistency in, in terms of how the fee is uh, calculated, um, as well as tracked, right? So that's part of our design guide, talks about um, you know, having a consistent methodology for designing the fee and tracking the costs associated with that. So did the core adhere to federal guidelines such as GAO's design guide for federal user fees, federal financial accounting standards, and Department of Defense policy? With regard, respect to our design guide, we would say that there were some um, uh, they were somewhat lacking in uh, uh, adherence to the design guide. Yes. So, can you discuss GAO's design guide for federal user fees and how it serves to ease the burden on taxpayers? Sure. Uh, the idea behind the design guide is is really to provide uh, federal agencies with a resource to um, sort of consider how these fees should be set. So. It has three uh, parts that we looked at. One is about setting fees. That includes this uh, beneficiary pays principle, uh, also considers um, the, having a consistent methodology and tracking your costs associated with the fees mm -hmm. that you're charging. Um, the second part of it is having a consistent review of those fees and uh, changing those fees periodically based on changing circumstances. Um, and so that was another area where we found that the core, you know, doesn't have a consistent policy for how it reviews fees. Some districts did review fees on occasion. Others hadn't reviewed fees in many, many, many years. Um, and then the last one is uh, sharing information with uh, fee payers and other stakeholders. So this is through, you know, posting information about your fee schedules, mm -hmm. providing information about how those fees are set. Uh, as well as including uh, stakeholder input when you are considering changes to your fee schedule. Very good. You, you've mentioned specific policy changes that, that you would recommend. Are there, are there other policy changes that you believe would address the issues identified in your report? Um, at this point, I think I would stick to the ones that we put in the report. Okay. <laughs> so how much time would it take to implement the recommendations in your report for the core? If the core were to implement every recommendation, how long should that take? That's uh, hard to say. Um, in terms of developing the policy uh, that goes across and is consistent across all uh, districts and divisions, I think there is going to be a process of gathering information about what all the districts and divisions do. Uh, what their circumstances are, why some uh, apply uh, compliance uh, uh, requirements and those fees are part of the fees and why others don't. Um, so I think there is some uh, aspect, there's some time that it will be taken to just sort of gather information, understand what's going on out there. Um, I think there's also some time will be needed to sort of get input from stakeholders about how they should be going about this. So it's hard to say exactly right. what that can take. Um, the Corps has indicated that they'll be working on this over the following, uh, for the next year. Um, and there's, the other aspect of this is developing methods to track their costs. That's a little bit trickier. Uh, they don't have systems in place that are, you know, ready to go in order to track these costs very, you know, very um, specifically. That can be an elaborate solution or it can be a simple solution. It sort of depends on how, um, you know, what the core systems look like and what makes the most sense. Okay. You're doing, you're doing great. I have three more questions for you, then I, I, I'm going to give you a break here for a minute. We'll go to the other <laughs> people. But what, what steps will GAO take to monitor the implementation of the report's recommendations and track any changes in the core practices over time? Yeah, so 
we have a requirement, or the, the Corps has a requirement, actually, uh, to provide a, a plan to us within 180 days. We just got that actually recently. They were early in providing us with more detailed response to our recommendations. Uh, we then um, track that on a periodic basis. We are required annually to update our, our recommendations, and so we do that annually to let everybody know, and that's public information about where the where those recommendations stand. But typically, we're, we're a little bit more frequent than annual. It's particularly when the agency is taking actions, we like uh, to stay in touch, yeah. So are there any ongoing or planned audits or reviews related to the Corps' activities that could provide us further insight into this matter? Uh, there is. Uh, the Water Resources Development Act required GAO to look at uh, concessionaire um, uh, charges, uh, and we are designing that. It's a, uh, another uh, one of my colleagues is leading that work in GAO. Um, they're designing that work to look at a number of other issues outside of administrative fees, since we sort of covered that in our report, uh, including lease rates and other uh, charges uh, that concessionaires uh, okay. face. Yeah. La last question for a little while. Are, are there any legislative changes you believe would facilitate better management of these fees and improve outcomes for fee play payers? Um, well, typically we um, hope that agencies respond to our recommendations, but in, in many cases uh, legislation requiring agencies to respond has been helpful uh, in, uh, when they haven't responded in a timely manner. Um, in looking at the uh, MARINA Act that you put forth, uh, we certainly have a, a, a support for the idea of posting schedules of fees. Um, we might have some concerns about caps in the sense that they mm -hmm. may not fully, you know, you may put the core in a position where they can't fully uh, recover the cost of their activities, which would then mean that those, that funding would come out of other appropriations. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, we, that's, that's how we can, you know, typically would, would look at that. Okay. Very good. Very good. Ms. johnson Muick. uh, the GAO reported that the Corps lacks agency-wide policy when it comes to setting and estimating administrative fees. Do you agree? Well, first of all, do you agree with the GAO's assessment? Uh, yes, sir. The, it was, it was uh, typically uh, powered down, if you will, to the districts and divisions to implement, and, and there really wasn't a national policy published. Okay. So if you do have administrative guidance, H how do you ensure that divisions and districts are properly following policy guidelines? Uh, we do periodic reviews, um, what we call sort of command staff reviews uh, periodically uh, of the di different regions to see how they're complying with policy. Um, of course, we have a lot of policies out there, a lot of uh, rules and requirements, so we don't cover 100% of everything, but mm -hmm. there's a rotating review that we do as part of our overall quality management. Okay. How does the Corps ensure that administrative fees are reviewed and updated regularly to reflect changes in costs and other relevant factors? Well, I think the GAO report concludes that we haven't been updating for mm -hmm. many, many years. In most places, um, the costs have not been updated. Uh, okay. So we haven't really been doing that. I think that's part of our corrective action plan is to put some uh, mark on the wall about how frequently we're going to review them in the future. GEO recommended that the core headquarters needs to provide greater oversight of its divisions and districts when it comes to updating their real estate administrative fees, including specifying what reviews should entail and the frequency of those reviews. Does, does the Corps plan to implement this recommendation agency-wide? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. How will you ensure that divisions and districts are following proper policy guidance? Well, again, it's, it's going to be those periodic reviews after the fact, so hopefully we get the guidance right and clear, and um, so there aren't a lot of questions about how it needs to be implemented, but we will um, have periodic reviews. We'll incorporate that into the reviews we're already doing um, of the field in terms of overall compliance. Okay. In fiscal years 2018 to 2022, the Corps collected an average of about $6 million per year in administrative fees with a median fee amount 
around $400, I think. What does the Corps do with administrative fees it collects? Uh, we pay labor and contract costs. Or, um, so typically when we charge an applicant, um, there are two ways it can work. We can put it in a fund and draw it down from, those, from that account as the work is done paying labor and if we contract out a document like something for NEPA or an appraisal or something it would be a contract cost um, so we would draw we draw down from those funds to pay the expenses of the activities leading up to issuance of the real estate instrument um, another way it works is in some districts we initially charge civil and um, civil O&M appropriations and then when we collect the administrative fee, we replace that money in the civil uh, uh, fund that we've spent from. So it could be either of those models. But it's basically used for the activities that have to be done to get to issuance of the real estate transaction. Are fees used to improve the respective division or district? Would, would fees be used for that in any way? form no no they're purely okay. uh the cost of of issuing the the transaction you know w one of the problems that a lot of members of congress have with with the core is with respect to n not so much fees but but how money spent in, in the core and there's always a level of frustration in in congress with with no earmarks, we, you, we, there will be major projects in the core. Like, let's use it. My district also includes the river industry, so all the barge companies are based out of Paducah. And even though Paducah is a pretty long drive from here in Jamestown, it's all in the first congressional district. And the, the there's some pretty big projects on the river with respect to uh, locks and dams and, and, and things like that, those types of major infrastructure projects. And we, we put money in the budget and then it, it either they come back and say, well, it's not enough or we had to spend it somewhere else or, or whatever. And what's happened is the, the core, the lack of, of confidence by many in Congress with, with, with the core and how they spend money has led to earmarks coming back. And one reason that uh, the Congress wants, wanted to support earmarks is to, is to really focus on money allocated to the, to the core. And you know, we, we, we appreciate the core. We know the core does, uh, provides a valuable service. But there, there's a lot of frustration with, with lots of different facets of the core. What we're, we're talking about today are, are, the, are the fees. And I know that with, the, with, the, with this industry, it's a tough industry for the people in the the owners the marine owners because it's seasonal and you know the labor challenges are hard the young people don't work anymore like they used to when i was i'm 51 when i was growing up a lot of people worked at del Hala in my home area a lot of people my age they don't these young people don't work anymore you know so that's created a big challenge for the marine owners but one of the challenges that uh, a lot of these lakes have there they, there aren't enough restaurants on the on the marinas and the fees just seem pretty excessive for anyone in the in the restaurant business because the restaurant business is a low margin tough business the labor situation is tough uh, we have food inflation now and because of because of the challenges of being very seasonal that's just a tough business and and the the there's just a huge desire among this industry to try to get these fees number one reasonable but but also transparent and consistent from uh you know every every lake i, I don't see why there's such a a variance in the in the fees and obviously we need more transparency and and reasonable reasonable fees and things like that so we can continue to grow we have a lot of people in in kentucky tennessee in these lakes that that want to make additional investment uh, but but the approval process is slow the the fee process kind of throws their budgets out of whack and it's uh it, it's it's been a challenge so i'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to work and and use the gao report and be able to improve some of the the challenges that that we have here 
so we can all work work better. But now I want to uh, go to uh, the inconsistent administrative fee inputs. And I had a question for uh, Major General Quander. I, I've seen examples of leases which specify no administrative fees will be charged. Where does the Corps derive the authority to charge fees on those leases if they have a lease that says no fees will be charged? Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Mr. Chairman, I, I do not. Okay. I'm not sure if it's a, it may be a policy question. I'm not sure. Okay. We'll, we'll follow up with you on that. Uh, so, Mr. Van Aal, I have here, this is from this is from your report. This chart shows how various districts calculated administrative fees right. and the inputs into how those fees are calculated. Uh, can you elaborate on this chart further and kind of explain what we're looking at here? Sure. This, uh, first of all, I just mentioned that these are not actual numbers. We did hypothesize a little bit. Uh, there's mm -hmm. some hypotheticals there. They're just rounding, but these are actual experiences that uh, mm -hmm. some fee payers are, uh, have. Um, this kind of shows the first example. Um, I think we have there, you know, in, including the compliance inspections in the fee. The second example doesn't include the compliance inspections in the fee, and so you have a different ultimate fee, right? There's a difference between a few hundred dollars and over a thousand dollars. Then in the next uh, couple of examples, we give different ways uh, that ho of how the hourly rates or the estimate of the number of hours that it takes um, can impact the fee, right? So if you have an hourly rate that you've ter determined is just $85, I think we have there, versus $100, obviously that's gonna cause a difference. Um, and if you are estimating four hours versus, you know, you're using a, a, a different resource that says it should take 10 hours, that's going to give you a different result as well. Um, the other thing I'd note about this chart is that for all of those inputs, they're not based on the actual costs uh, that the core experiences for it. So, for example, I think we have a range there from 340 to over, you know, something like $1,900. That's a pretty big spread. Uh, so it's a pretty big spread. But the actual cost might be $250 or it might be $2,500, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so, and part of that goes to the tracking of uh, the costs associated with these and the, and the review periodically of whether, you know, how the core is doing in terms of recouping the costs that it actually uh, has in terms of uh, doing these, these types of uh, instruments. Did, did you see, could you tell in your research whether the Corps privatizes anything? Do they uh, contract outside of the Corps for any type of management services, did you recall? Uh, no, I mean, for things like um, perhaps an appraisal or something like that, they may use a company that does yeah. appraisals, but, but no. In general, these are uh, the charges associated with uh, core personnel conducting work. Major General, do you, do you know the answer to that? Does the core privatize anything, like any of these uh, inspections or reviews? If, 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 For example, if a marina wants to expand, I'm sure there's a study or something that has to be conducted. Is that always done in-house or... Or is, there, are you, is the Corps even allowed to go out of house to do any type of those reviews or inspections? I was just curious. Chairman, I'm not aware of us going out of house, but if we can follow up with you, we can do some homework on that and get back to your staff. Okay. Uh, Ms. Ms. Johnson, Muick, why are the administrative calculation amounts so different in the varying districts? Those were four different districts, uh, pretty much the same thing. The, ranging from $340 to uh, $1,900. Do, do you have any idea why they vary so much from district to district? I think this tracks back to the finding from GAO that, that the inputs to the calculation are not the same. And that's part of what the policy will have to drive to improve so that um, all of the same activities are being uh, considered when the fee is set. Um, so some things were left out of these, um, you know, the lower end range on what you see on that table um, 
they didn't have all the same activities in them as the higher range did. So, you know, what's the right answer? Do, were we, were we, do we include activities we shouldn't have been charging for in the higher amounts, or did we leave something out in the lower amounts? So I think that's what our policy uh, issuance will get after, is listing these are the things that have to be considered. Now, un understand every transaction isn't the same. If it's a oh. renewal, we might not need to do much in the way of a NEPA document. If it's a new out grant, we may have a much bigger product that's more expensive that we have to do. So there will be still be variances. But it, it, it doesn't seem like there's a, a lot of guidance, in my opinion. But as a representative from the Army Corps headquarters, uh, can you speak to the lack of headquarters guidance to districts to standardize fees? Well, I think the rationale for why there wasn't guidance um, specific to this in the past was because it was essentially left to the individual districts and regions because of the fact scenarios being so different. So in the GAO report they mentioned, and maybe I'll tie into the question you asked General Quandra earlier, um, why we didn't charge in a leasing scenario. So sometimes when there's a public um, interest that's being served or one of the, or the, the Corps' missions in mm -hmm. recreation, like, for example, a lease that goes to the state for a, what we call a park and recreational lease. We don't charge administrative fees at all. They're waived. So that discretionary application for the individual transactions was left to the field. And I think that's how we wind up with some inconsistencies across the board. So if we issue policy from the headquarters, we're going to take away some of that ability to be flexible in, in order to try to become more consistent. One of the complaints I've heard from uh, marine owners that have been in business a long time is that years ago, the the their local core person had a lot of influence, had the uh, ability to make decisions, minor decisions, there on the spot. But over time, the corps become more bureaucratic, and all the decision making comes from, from headquarters, or at least the, the regional office, whether it be Nashville, Memphis, Louisville, or wherever in my, my congressional district, and the, and the local people, the local representatives don't have the ability to make simple decisions anymore, and it takes more time and obviously adds to the increase of cost. Is that something that, that you're aware of, or do you, have you ever heard anyone make that assessment before that's, that's been dealing with the Corps a long time from a marina owner standpoint? Not from a marina owner's standpoint. I, I don't see anything that's been pulled up to the headquarters in the business of just general use of federal land and civil works. Um, it's really always been delegated to the field. The only part in the marina specifically that, that I've seen at the Washington level is the term. You mentioned earlier uh, that some we may be wanting to look at more investments and longer term um, instruments. and there are some requirements to come up to Washington and, and also to the secretary, the ASA for Civil Works, on terms longer than 50 years. Okay. Uh, General Quandre, how do districts in the, in the Great Lakes and Ohio River Division differ in determining inputs for administrative fees? Chairman, we do have some variances. Uh, we have a regional policy, but just quite frankly, we got to do a better job of enforcing it so that we have that consistency across the different districts. Uh, but for us, we do have some significant differences because I have the Great Lakes, and the Great Lakes is very different than the Ohio River Basin and how uh, we look at things. And so those are two very different watersheds and two very different, um, I guess, environments in which uh, we would look at either administrative fees or, or we're dealing with the local communities. Uh, but, but determined to, to that point, um, we, we do have some differences and variances between the districts. Um, I think the district here and, and your, um, the one that primarily serves uh, your, your district here with Nashville, um, they have a, a set structure of, of um, a couple of different costs for standard administrative fees. And then as Andrew said, the complex fees are very detailed and breakdown structure. Um, we do engage uh, with the local community 
but we have to do a better job of explaining what these fees are for, to your point. So I'll ask this question uh, for uh, Ms. Johnson, Muick, and uh, Major General. The, the substantial differences in how districts use inputs to calculate their costs and the resulting differences in administrative fees, as demonstrated by the chart I showed, raises concerns about how the Corps calculates cost uh, equitable, e equitably and fairly across the board. I think that's uh, the point that we all agree. C can you all give me assurances that the Corps will define the types of activities involved in fee setting and, and try to get some type of consistency and, and uh, more, more transparency on fee determination. That's kind of the purpose of the hearing and, and we just, because the GAO report is, is consistent with what, what I'm hearing in the district, I guess the question is, can we expect to see the core be more transparent and consistent on, on fee setting? I'll, I'll start with you, Ms. Johnson. You all right, thank you, sir. Um, let's take the transparency one first. I think, yes, we're committed to trying to do that. I think um, the record shows that we've done a better job of that when we're charging more, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a fee tailored to a transaction that's complex. We've communicated the basis of those fees one-on-one -on -one with that particular um, entity. We haven't done a good job of that in the um, sort of... Uh, standardized fees that we have for less uh, complex transactions. So I think we do have a plan to get after that. It's part of our corrective action plan. So yes, I think we have a commitment there on being more transparent. On the consistency piece of it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a qualified answer. I think we are committed to putting out policy that leads us to work towards consistent inputs into, t into the setting the fees. So we're there. Um, I, don't, I don't want it to be misinterpreted that that means that in every jurisdiction and every transaction the fee will be the same because, because it's, many of them are fact specific, but the methodology we use to get to the fee will be the same and consistent and more defensible in line with the GAO recommendations and that's what we're committed to implementing. Major General. Uh, Chairman, uh, I just echo what Ms. johnson Muick said. We're committed to supporting the findings and recommendations from the GAO with the Corrective Action Plan. Well, the, 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 the role of this committee, and I mentioned that in the opening statement, we, we definitely want to ensure that uh, the government allows the private sector to continue to, to grow and expand, make additional investment, generate more federal tax revenue, uh, continue to pay uh, good wages. And we're concerned about the, the, the core practice. I think we've, we've gone over that point over the last hour. It appears the core has a long way to go when it comes to amending the process of administering their, their fees. So the committee has heard from numerous stakeholders, lots of concerns, many are in the room, that operate marinas or other businesses on core property. Their, their stories all have a common denominator that the, the core lacks transparency with fee payers when it comes to charges they are imposing on private business owners. So uh, Mr. Van All, as GAO was conducting its assessment of the course, what did you and your team find when it came to how the core communicated policies with, with fee schedules? Uh, how the core communicated policies and fee schedules? Were, were there any, was there any public way of knowing up front how much the businesses were gonna be charged? Was there decent communication? What, what did you find in your report? Yeah, it, it varied across districts, um, I would say. Uh, some did uh, have some fee schedules on their websites, others did not. Um, okay. There was very, but even those that did have some uh, discussion of fees didn't really have uh, a lot of detail uh, behind what those fees are or how they're calculated. 
Um, in the correspondence that we uh, reviewed, uh, it, you'd see, it, like as, as I said before, you didn't see the detail about what went into the fee mm -hmm. or what was, you know, in the exception of some of the custom fees as we talked about, um, that can get much more detailed because, because it is such a larger dollar amount. Um, and it's a you know a more complex transaction that they, there's probably a lot more uh, uh, interaction with the fee payer. Um, uh, some districts though did have uh, you know an opportunity for uh, this, the public to review or to provide input on, on changes to their fee schedules. Um, we saw that in the Nashville district recently, um, but not all districts had a consistent way of uh, allowing for the public to provide input into what their uh, into their fees. Okay. I mean, putting government fees on the internet, that was kind of a... It was an easy that's, one. That's kind of a no-brainer, right? That's something <laughs> I thought every agency did, but apparently not. What, what do you recommend the Corps do to be more transparent with fee payers? Um, well, it, it's, it's going to sort of depend on ultimately what policy uh, the Corps develops. But um, in general, we're um, hopeful that the core will engage with uh, fee payers and, and stakeholders and others that are impacted by those fees, particularly when they're reviewing or determining um, or considering changes to those fees. Um, that can be done in a number of different ways. Uh, there can be public forums. There can be um, outreach in different ways. Uh, we won't, wouldn't prescribe to the core exactly how to, to go about that. Um, but we do think that engagement with the public and those that are impacted by those fees is important go ongoing. Well, last question with respect to this. Would, did you find that the core had any level of communication with the stakeholders with respect to how it charges administrative fees? Was that something you found in your report? Was there, was there communication consistently with all the different divisions, was there some in some divisions and none in others, or was there very little all the way around? Uh, some, in, some in some districts, very little in others, I would say. Um, okay. But you, you definitely saw um, uh, when the court did engage the public in terms of changes to their fee schedules or changes to certain ways that they were uh, thinking of uh, the fees, you saw some, um, you know, th that public input being reflected in mm -hmm. what the core ended up doing. In one case, we saw some fees being removed because it was, you know, through more discussion with those stakeholders, it was determined that right. there was going to be a public benefit versus a private, you know, a benefit of a, for a few users. Uh, so you do see the impact of public engagement when that does occur. Okay. Ms. Johnson, you, why does the core currently not have a public website describing how administrative fees are charged, how they're calculated and charged, or how they're created and charged. I mean, that, I think that would be a good starting point, maybe, moving forward to have. Well, that is one of the action items in the corrective action plan to move in that direction. So. So yes, I do believe we're gonna have that in the future. Why we don't have it now, I, I don't know that I can answer that. In my own personal experience in the, this GAO report, uh, you know, I don't think we ever really looked at these administrative fees as user fees in the same way that GAO did. Um, it's not the same as paying a park admission um, to go into the national park. This is really a, a expense to issue a, a product, so I think that was, a little bit of a um, nuance that we weren't necessarily tracking. I don't think our financial auditors report these administrative fees as user fees currently. Um, and so I think that's it's just a different way of looking at it and that may explain why it was never out there before. So I guess two questions. Have you, have you considered a website and since the GEO recommended that, uh, would you, are there plans to have a website that would detail the the fee schedule and well so we were just at the beginning stages of of figuring out what our policy is going to be but i think it would most likely be the already existing websites for the individual projects okay. or the district websites would be the public facing page where uh these would be posted okay one of the goal of the course 2021 through 2020, 2031, Natural Resources Management Strategic Plan is effective communication. How is the core 
implementing this strategic plan to improve communication with external stakeholders? Ms. Johnson, Muick. So I think that's another one of the six recommendations from GAO is that we develop a, a communication strategy before mm -hmm. rolling out any changes on updates to the administrative fees and the administrative fee methodology. So um, I think we're going to adhere to our strategic goal there by developing a communication strategy and plan um, prior, so no one will be surprised once this comes online. Okay. Let, let me ask Major General, the GEO report shows an example of an administrative fee rationale document provided to a fee payer. Next to it is an internal core document providing much more information about the input determining that fee. Why is the core recording this information internally but choosing not to share more detailed information with fee payers? It, Chairman, that's, that's when I have to get back with you on. Uh, I, I saw that in the report as well. Um, but, but Chairman, if I can, just going back to the effective communications, if I could, that Ms. Johnson Muick was talking about. Um, again, across the Great Lakes Ohio River Division, we're, um, we're a little bit uneven how we do it. Um, but I think we've, we've got at least one, one organization within the district, a, a division that does it really well. And, and they're engaging with the marina owners. We do a lot of stakeholder engagements, uh, but it's functional. Mm -hmm. And so we'll do it with, with the river industry. We'll do it with other pieces of industry. I, I think we have to probably do a better job with this constituency. Um, and, and again, we're a little bit uneven. Uh, but the example I'll give you is last week, the Nashville district uh, hosted a marina workshop with the marina owners, some which were here last week, where they have a chance to talk about issues and concerns. And then in November, we attend their meeting. Um, and so twice a year, we're engaging back and forth in dialogue. We just have to do more of that. You, you mentioned you oversee a very large division that with uh, lots of geographic diversity and various types of small businesses that operate on, on the core properties. Does the core headquarters provide you with any guidance on how to communicate administrative fees with your division? Chairman, I think, there's, I think there's a policy on it. We have a regional policy on how we talk about things. We're just not doing a good job of overseeing the policy. And I, I think as we look at the GAO report, we're going to look at to see, revise our policies, um, and then uh, make sure that we're doing a better job uh, from the headquarters down to the division down to the districts on enforcing those policies. Yeah. Ms. Johnson, Muick, are there requirements for the length of recreation lease terms, do you know? Because from, from what I understand, the Corps only provides 25-year lease, 25 year leases in some districts while providing 50-year leases in others. Do you know what the policy is on that? Yes, sir. So specifically to commercial concession leases, um, 25 years is the maximum term in our policy, uh, but that there are also the, there is also the ability to have two option years, two, two options to those leases, one a 10-year term and, an, and an, the other a 15-year term. So theoretically, depending on the development proposed, you can get up to 50 years in total. Um, that is a authority that's already in existence at the field level. Now, if we want to go above the 50 years, the act, actually that has to go to uh, the ASA for Civil Works for a, pub, a public deter, a determination of public interest. Right. And I just wanted to mention the Marine Act uh, sets 50-year lease terms in that, in that legislation that, that we're currently uh, pushing in the House. I want to talk about the economic impact on the, the lakes and, and rivers because that's, again, why this is so important to me in, in this congressional district, why it's important to the to oversight committee. As I said in my opening remarks, lakes like Lake Cumberland have wide-ranging impacts on Kentucky's economy. It's, it's vital that the Corps work alongside small businesses, not against them, to make recreation sites like this one accessible and enjoyable for all and ensure that areas like this continue to generate massive economic impact. Ms. Johnson-Muick, 
and uh, Major General, within 30 miles, I'll start with you, Major General, and then Ms. Ms. Johnson Mewitt can answer this as well, but within 30 miles of this lake, the economic impact is over 1,000 jobs, over $164 million investor spending, $107 million in sales, and over $33 million in, in labor income. There are numerous other lakes in this district and across the U.S. that have similar economic impacts. I live in the between Del Hollow and Barron River uh, lakes. Would you agree, would you all agree that, that small businesses operating on cores have, uh, have public value? I'm, I'm sure you all agree with that, right? So uh, these small business owners are necessary for Americans to enjoy recreation sites. What is the Corps doing to work with business owners to promote economic growth in these recreation projects? Is that something the Corps thinks about, uh, the, the economic impact? And like, when you make a, a decision, do you think about how this decision could positively or negatively affect the economic growth in the region, Major General? Chairman. Um Meeting some of the, the folks here who are working uh, just prior to the hearing and, and hearing their stories, it is absolutely impactful on you when you hear um, uh, what, what they're trying to do and their challenges for their businesses. And so being here uh, makes it real. And, and we appreciate you letting us come here to hear their stories and to uh, and talk about it. I, I don't have any um, specific um, or concrete examples of how we are or we not uh, engaging with our small business is to uh, listen to their concerns, uh, but it's something that um, we're committed to trying to figure out and how to do within our existing policies. Okay. Ms. Johnson, you it. And, sir, from a technical aspect, I don't know that our policies are geared towards um, the purpose that you described. Certainly, we take a lot of pride in being a part of that mm -hmm. economic development and offering those opportunities and we do master planning at projects you know there are, there are factors like um, the carrying capacity of a lake and things that go into it where we might end up having to say no to something um, that would be a benefit to economic development but may not be in the public's interest from a safety perspective or something like that so I think we're we're very uh, um, aware of the impacts, and we want to assist and promote and be a part of that where we can, within the confines of the of the management of the project. Okay. Well, good. That, that's something I certainly hope that we'll leave you with that you understand and appreciate. And I'm sure you do, but I, I just want to make sure. Uh, that everyone understands the massive economic impact that these lakes have and and sometimes there's unintended consequences to government policy and we just want to make sure that the economic impact is a factor in, in all your decision making we understand public safety is and clean water and all that so is, is the priority uh, but but we should also consider after public safety and clean water and things like that the economic impact and any unintended consequences that that, that might that a certain decision by the core may have on the economic impact of the region speaking of that does the core consider the economic impact of its administrative fee schedules and leasing terms communicating with concessionaires and i mentioned that earlier the that's a tough business. That's a tough, low-margin business in a seasonal industry. Do you have any, do you consider or communicate with, with those specific stakeholders in setting fees, the concessionaires? Because that was one of the areas where, when I was looking at the, the GAO report and listening to the stakeholders, it seemed like the, the fee schedule for those industries with the slim margins uh, are probably as hurtful as, as any of the, the fees throughout the, the core. Is that something that you all consider or do you have any communication with the concessionaires? Um. Yes, I think we want to take into consideration how it impacts them. I don't think we always have the uh, 
-hmm. full story or the full data on on those impacts. Uh, but I guess it's a I guess I would I want to try to explain it this way. We're not trying to set a fee to be exorbitant or or we, while we want to take in the impacts of the fee, the the basis for the fee is our cost. And so the only way to drive a fee down is to do less, which we may or may not be able to do, or try to do it more efficiently. But the requirements, or you know, haven't changed, and so that that's the dilemma: is while we may be having a negative impact somewhere, we still have a fee to collect, and the and the basis for that fee is an actual cost or something close to actual cost of the agency. So if you drive the fee down, where then it's sort of like um, my GAO counterpart mentioned, we would have to uh, take the funds from appropriation from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Major General, would you like to comment on that with respect to the concessionaires? Uh, Chairman, I'll, I'll, I think Ms. Paula Muick, or Johnson Muick answered it. I, I don't have anything else to add on the question, Chairman. So the GAO report highlights that, that neither core headquarters, divisions, or districts have requirements to provide opportunities for stakeholder input. Would you all be open to considering stakeholder input on the economic impact of the core fee policies on small business owners? Is that something you all would consider, more stakeholder input? Yes, sir. That is one of one part of our corrective action plan is to try to come up with some methodology in our policy and how we're going to collect that, that input. Yes. Major General. Yes, Chairman. We're going to follow the corrective action plan. Um, again, we do some of those stakeholder engagements already, but it's uneven across the board, across the districts. I, I appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Ms. Johnson, has the core headquarters considered the benefits of extending lease terms to small businesses to include, to increase business investment in services and facilities for recreation purposes? The reason I ask that, if, if you only have a, a short-term lease, it's kind of hard to justify a pretty significant investment. Uh, in an expansion project. So is extending lease terms, has that ever been a part of the thought process at the core? It, it is, I mean, it has been, it, but it has to be justified by the development plan and the investment plan. So that's why you see the range from a five year all the way up through a 50 year. It's really dependent on what's proposed. Right. So I wanna go back to this concessionaires part Concessionaires make rental payments to the cores to operate businesses on these properties. The revised graduated rental system totals gross receipts and is determined based on a percentage rate of 4% of certain business services like food and gasoline sales. How is this gross rate calculation determined? Ms. Johnson, do you have any idea? Uh, no, I think it's a it's a coordination at the district with the concessionaire on the on the um, on the books. Essentially, there's some data that has to be turned into the core to make that calculation. Our revised graduated rental system rates standard nationwide. Yes, they are. Yes. Has the core undertaken any economic impact assessments of the graduated rental system rate? In other words, are, are these rates regularly studied and updated to reflect current economic conditions such as inflation? To my knowledge, they haven't been reviewed in a long time. I, I would hope that that would be something that, that we can do. That's a, that's a tough, tough industry. And that's one of the challenges. When I go to the chamber meetings and economic development groups and different assessments in the region, in the, in the areas of my congressional district, and again, we have all the lakes in, in my very spread out congressional uh, congressional uh, district. There's there's a desire for more restaurants on the lake, but the margin and, and a lot of the the uh, challenges that business owners have when they try to develop a, a business plan to do something like that on the lake is is the fee schedule. So I think it's it's uh, having unintended consequences on the on the economic growth and the potential 
of the of the region. So that's, I hope that's something that, that you would look at because the that industry's changed a lot and the margins are are razor thin and that just seems like a pretty big fee with no real formula or data to to back that four percent up as as the as the standard rate. So that's just something I would, I would hope you'd consider. Uh, sir, I believe that's a, uh, one of the topics of the um, just now starting GAO new review audit that was mentioned earlier today. So I think we'll be getting some GAO input onto that and probably have uh, some further uh, actions afterwards. Great. Well, I have good news for you. That I'm not going to ask any more questions. So we, we said we'd try to keep this an hour and a half. It's been exactly an hour and a half. Uh, I'm going to have a, a brief closing statement, but before I do, I, I would love to give you all an opportunity to, to say anything uh, that you, you, you feel needs to be added. Before I do, uh, I, I just want to thank you all. I know you have a tough job, and we all are on the same team here. We all want to see uh, growth and, and uh, economic expansion of the lakes. We want to see our, our America enjoy the, the, the lakes at its full potential. Uh, I just think that there are some some bureaucratic hurdles that can be overcome here for our marine owners. We we certainly would love to see quicker answers on uh, questions with respect to expansion proposals. We would love to see more transparency in the in the fee process, uh, more consistency with with fees from uh, marina to marina. And, and things like that. Uh, I'll, I'll start with uh, Mr. Vaughn. I'll give you an opportunity to, to say anything, but I appreciate the report that you do. The Oversight Committee works very closely with GAO. We depend on GAO. We depend on Inspector Generals. Inspector General, we have, uh, I've said this about IGs. We have good IGs. We have average IGs and we have poor IGs. Uh, but we've had really good luck with the GAO, and I, I appreciate that. And uh, well, thank you. Love to yield some time to you if you wanted to mention anything moving uh, forward. I would just mention, uh, Chairman, that the report that was uh, that we've just begun looking at concessionaires. We're we're happy to talk to your staff about it. We can get you in touch with the right people in our in GAO. That work is being done under a mandate under the Water Resources Development Act, and so. But we can certainly um, talk to you about the scope and methodology of that report. Okay. Thank you very much. And Ms. Ms. Johnson, you, okay, again, I appreciate you being here. I know we've thrown a lot of questions at you, but again, we're all on the same team and uh, working together. So I'd be happy to yield time to you if you had any closing remarks. No, thank you, sir. Uh, really not much to add other than I met with my team earlier this week and we've already begun our um, start with some milestones and plans forward on implementing our corrective action plan. So we're committed to, to those actions. So thank you. Very good. And Major General, first of all, thank you for your service to our country. And I'd love to yield some time to you if you wanted to have any type of closing remarks. Chairman, all I want to say is just thank you for inviting us to, to Lake Cumberland and, uh, and being a chance to talk about how we're going to address some of the uh, actions from the GEO report. And as uh, uh, Ms. Johnson Muick said, we're committed to the uh, uh, working in the corrective action plan. Very good. I want to close by thanking again everyone for being here, the witnesses especially. But I also want to thank all the the marina owners who are present. You don't get this enough, but thank you for your investment. Thank you for the risk that you take, uh, for the economic impact that you provide, the the good jobs that you continue to uh, create. We appreciate that and want to do everything we can uh, as your member of Congress, as the chairman of the House Oversight Committee, anything I can do to help you continue to grow and expand and generate tax revenue and pay workers and, and uh, continue to make Kentucky one of the, the best tourist destinations in the world for our beautiful marinas. The findings in the GAO report uh, really underscore the need for greater transparency, consistency, and accountability in fee setting practices. And that's what we had this field hearing today. Uh, we're gonna continue to work closely with the Corps to ensure that the GAO recommendations are implemented and implemented quickly. Uh, we believe that, that the report is uh, very 
well written. Uh, the data was, was accurate that was used in determining the recommendations. Uh, we're, we have a priority to see that these recommendations are implemented very quickly and we want to do that. If there's ever a time that we can work with you all on anything and helping to implement recommendations with respect to fee, transparency, and consistency, please let us know. Uh, we're going we're gonna to be watching this very closely. And I want to thank everyone that, that came here today because there's many people have traveled a long way to get here uh, throughout the America. So thank you for being here. Please continue to enjoy the view and enjoy all the hospitality of the Lake Cumberland region. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. And if there's ever anything we can do in the House Oversight Committee uh, to, to be of any assistance, don't hesitate. And again, with those that are in the first district, I, I do want to recognize a couple of people from my district office. Uh, I have my district director, Sandy Simpson from Monroe County. She is one of the nicest houseboats on Del Hollow Lake, by the way. Uh, and, and Sandy's in charge of complaints. If anybody has any complaints, you can take them out with Sandy there. And then Sarah Coffin's my legislative director. She's from just up 127, the next county over in, in Liberty. Then we have the great oversight committee staff that are going to be working tirelessly on, on policy and anything we can do to help uh, make our lakes even better. So again, thank you all for being here today, and we'll be sticking around and uh, talking to people after this is over with. But uh, declare this field hearing or whatever the proper term was for it uh, uh, adjourned and hopefully we will get something very productive out of this very quickly. Thank you all for being here.